Welcome back. All right, so I want to discuss Gary Bettman. I want to discuss Gary Bettman because every now and then I need to do a video regard in regards to Gary Bettman because really what Gary Bettman is, he is he's well paid for what he does. He is the commissioner for the National Hockey League. He is the employee of the owners of the National Hockey League. So how did this happen? When I started watching hockey in the 80s, the relationship between owners and players was the owners were here and the players were down here. And that's how the owners liked it. And this dates all the way back to, well, the beginnings of the NHL, where basically if you were in the National Hockey League, here's a couple of bucks, go out there, play hockey. I'm the owner. I decide what you get paid. And not only that, but contracts, no, 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 no. we own you. Uh, we own the players until they retire. If they're traded, it's because we decide to trade them. If they become free agents, it's because we decide that that's what's going to happen. And so players were basically just servants to their team until they retired. The WHA came along and changed that. The WHA started playing, paying players real money, giving them good contracts, allowing them to be free agents, giving them some freedom of movement. So the National Hockey League was forced to spend extra money, forced to allow players to have a little bit of freedom so they wouldn't bolt for the other league. So the NHL naturally wanted to crush the WHA. Uh, Clarence Campbell, I, I still believe the longest serving president the NHL ever had. He was there for a very long time. Uh, very, very vocal and, and very, not not really a, a player's guy. Like this was, this was a league that was geared towards the owners. This was all about the owners and what's going to make us the most money. And we don't really care about the players making more money. Player safety wasn't a thing. That's that wasn't really their their issue. You know, player gets hurt, fine. We'll bring in helmets. Player gets hurt, fine. Goalies can wear a mask. But in general, they weren't leaders on this. The NHL's always been reactionary. So, like I said, when the WHA started paying guys good money, started letting guys have free agency, the NHL had to follow. The NHL's never been a leader. That's just not been a thing. And I've seen a lot of this lately about the NHL. They they just their followers. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the way that's worked. And in the 80s, the, the league was doing pretty well. You had Gretzky as the most marketable uh, player in the history of the game, arguably. And I say arguably because you could argue that, you know, Gordy Howe for a very long time was a very marketable player. Bobby Hull, Bobby Orr, there were many. But Gretzky really brought everything together and his point totals were amazing. He was on the highlight reels every night. And he kind of changed the game. And then, of course, when he went to California, that brings about a lot more interest south of the border, interest specifically in California. Now we have three teams in California, a Mighty Ducks movie that spawned a team, and that Mighty Ducks movie, would it have happened without Gretzky going to the Kings? Maybe. Maybe it would have. But uh, the, the fact is that everything changed in the 80s. And so in the 90s, things are going pretty well for the league, and the players are starting to realize we aren't getting our fair share. Players are getting frustrated with not getting their fair share. The players had been represented by Alan Eagleson. Alan Eagleson was crooked. He was crooked, and he was in with the owners. So while he looked like he was a good agent for the players, and he looked like he was a good leader for the players, and certainly the, he palled around with all of them, he was making deals with owners, and he was... There's there's a video on the channel on Eagleson, and he, he really was in it for himself more than anything else. So the players had been treated poorly by owners as well as by their own leadership so this brings us to where we are right now we've got don fear who may very well through an independent investigation end up in a situation where he ends up being out right as the nhlpa's head but gary bettman doesn't appear to be in any danger at all because again he works for the owners the owner's concern is the owner's bottom line and nothing has happened to this date that negatively impacts that bottom line so for Gary Bettman, he's been the commissioner since February 1st of 1993. One of the longest serving leaders in sports, right? And he is, and I, I mean historically, like we're up to about 30 years here. It's been a long time. And when he came in, the league was doing well. The league's doing better now financially, although uh, the last two years has definitely hit the league. It's hit every league. It's been uh, a whole new world for them to negotiate, right? So... He was a vice president and general counsel to the NBA, and I remember when he got hired from the NHL, and immediately I heard, oh no, he's going to run it like the NBA. Oh, this is, this is ridiculous. Why are they hiring somebody from the NBA? Why aren't they hiring somebody who's hockey? 
who's a hockey related figure why are they bringing somebody in from the national basketball association which is a well-run league in and of itself but shouldn't it be somebody who's hockey related but what the owners are looking at is that Bettman was a VP and general counsel for that, as well as he's a graduate of Cornell and New York University School of Law. This is a smart businessman and and lawyer. And and by businessman, I mean he understands the numbers. He understands the numbers game. He had seen this in the NBA, and they're like, hey, we want to make some money like, like they do. So they bring him in. And he was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2018. And I think part of it is due to just how long he's been in the NHL and how much the league has grown. And there's the argument about whether or not he's held the league back. Arizona comes to mind, right? Gary, Without Gary Bettman, with a, a commissioner who was more open to the idea of moving teams around, I don't think we'd have teams in Arizona or Florida. And we can have that debate about whether that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. But Bettman's been very clear that he wants to expand in the southern you know, the, the Sun Belt of the U.S., as it's called, and that that's, that's his focus, is trying to create new fans. Whereas for NHL fans, they sometimes say, hey, we've got existing fans here that aren't being served if we had a team in this city or that city. And so that's been the argument from the beginning. Now, the thing was, he followed Gil Stein. Gil Stein was a disaster. Gil Stein was put in there to replace John Ziegler. John Ziegler was good. And he was a good talker, and he was he was very good. He, uh, it felt like the relationship between the players and John Ziegler wasn't a bad one. But Gil Stein coming in was kind of a warning shot that things needed to change. John Ziegler had been in control, had been the president of the NHL, not commissioner, president, when the 1992 NHL strike came around. The NHL players had been saber-rattling for a while. Like, okay, we're, we're tired of this. We are tired of this. We want things to change. Uh, owners are making a ton of money. We're we're not getting what we believe to be our fair share. And so they did the only thing they could. They went on strike. The strike in 1992 is why we have lockouts. The players had leverage. So April 1st through April 11th, the league was shut down. Games get postponed. Everything gets postponed. It just, it was, it was kind of a dark thing because up until then, the NHL never shut down. We'd watch the NFL get shut down and use replacement players. That was a terrible idea. Major League Baseball gets shut down numerous times, lose a World Series over it. And for the NBA, there'd been this kind of uneasy peace at times between owners and players. And you that's kind of the best you can hope for these days. So out of this strike, because the players have all the leverage, right? So the games have been almost completed for the season. And now they're like, you just go on strike. Be ashamed something happened to your playoffs. So the players kind of got what they wanted. They got an increase in their playoff bonuses. Uh, they got control over the licensing of their likeness, at least on some level. Uh, changes to free agency. I believe the, the the age dropped from 31 to 28 or something along those lines. But it was, it was 31 for a long time there. And so the owners fired John Ziegler. The owners said, no, we, we can't. This is, this is ridiculous. Uh, we've got a, a guy in there as the president, and now we're having to fork over more money because of how all this went. The players held us, held the gun the gun to our heads? I don't think so. That's not how this works. From then until now, it's always been the owners locking the players out. But the owners control a lot of the narrative. The owners are able to, to get press, press releases out. They're able to get Gary Bettman out to the media. Gary Bettman is the lightning rod. What's going on right now is exactly what the owners want. And I've said that before. So we get to 94-95. We ended up with a 48 game season because of a lockout. And when I'm doing career videos, I just, it's an aside. I throw that out there like 48 games. It's a short lockout, shortened season. Like we can just sort of gloss that over. And I kind of have to in career videos, right? But in this case, the owners wanted a salary cap or a luxury tax. See, they were open to a luxury tax at one point. And what ended up happening was that some of the bigger markets broke with the rest and said, we need to have a season. We can't afford not to have a season. We are very concerned about what this would do to the marketplace. The NHLPA, for their credit, wanted revenue sharing. So what the NHLPA's idea was, fine, you guys want to have this salary cap. Why don't you guys all share revenues? You're all owners. Why don't you all come together, share revenues so that the rich, rich teams can help out the poor teams. And then it all kind of balances out. And then we, the players, make whatever the market dictates we can make. 
which makes some sense, right? We always hear about, you know, the market, what the market dictates. And right now we're seeing players getting nine, nine and a half million contracts, big contracts. And we look at this as fans and say, so how are they going to pay for that next year? And eh, they'll worry about that later. That's where all those those buyouts and, and all those things happen and dead money ends up happening and you see guys in LTIR and it all kind of starts in 94, 95. But again, they don't get their salary cap. They come back without the cap. The owners were livid, let's be honest. The owners weren't happy with the idea that there wasn't a salary cap. So what ends up happening out of that is you lose a team out of Winnipeg. That goes to Arizona. You lose a team out of Quebec. Goes to Denver, Colorado. In part because of what happens with this lockout. Because you, you don't get the cost certainty that might have. And I'm only saying might have because there's no guarantee. But it might have allowed for those teams to stay where they were. Which means that owners can turn around and say, those greedy players, that's why the Jets moved. That's why the Nordiques moved. And as soon as that becomes the narrative, as soon as we buy into the idea that this player that's making $10 million is really greedy, but the owner that's made over a billion dollars isn't, that's where the narrative becomes one that the owners are controlling. And the owners have controlled the narrative for a very long time. 2004-2005 uh, is a great example of this. And there were dueling uh, offers. The thing that I found interesting during that locked out, lockout season was that you would see the players make an offer to the owner that they knew was going to get rejected. The owners would then make a counter offer to the players they knew was going to get rejected. Why? Because we, the fans, were the ones that they wanted on their side. And so both sides got engaged in this. And I honestly ended up kind of feeling bad for the players because the public sentiment seemed to turn against the players and say, yeah, well, the players are being greedy here. The players should accept that salary cap because, you know, we want... One of the one of the talking points was, and I remember Batman himself saying this, saying, you know, we want to we want to support the fans, and ticket prices are going through the roof because look at the costs. So those get those get to, you know passed on to the consumer, and ticket prices are much higher now than they were then. So that whole argument of well, we're we're worried about the fans to me is one that I it, uh, I, I I'm not a big fan of it. Um, anytime I hear that, whether it's from ownership, whether it's from Batman, I don't buy it because ticket prices just keep racking up. The price of jerseys keeps going up and all of it is related. When you can get a jersey for $40, that's exactly the same as the one you can get from the NHL. The difference being that you've got a logo on the front that's NHL licensed and the price difference becomes about three times what it was. Uh, with the blank one, that's the concern. And that's that's something that honestly, you know, it, it, some of that's players too. The players have a certain amount that they make off of uh, various sales around the NHL. And all the revenue sharing becomes this kind of white noise for us as fans. Kind of like, just, just play hockey. We, who cares who makes the money off the hockey cards? Well, they did. And so that that was a major talking point too. Back as, back as recent as, as, well, back as far as 92, when that first strike took place, right? Hockey cards were huge in 92, so people wanted their, their cut, and that was a, a pretty major talking point. So in 2004, 2005, we don't get a season. And we were counting down to them wiping out the season. And as a fan, I remember thinking, just, just call it off. Just call it off and just start over. Then the concern was... So they've wiped out one season. Are they going to do it for a second one? And there was real concern that could happen. Bob Goodenow sits down and and they, they ended up agreeing to a salary cap. And coming out of this, um, heads rolled at the NHLPA starting with Goodenow, right? Bob Goodenow was done. As soon as he agreed to that salary cap, he was finished. Bob Goodenow had said for years, we will not agree to a salary cap. There will be no salary cap. And, and I'm going to prevent a salary cap. But I, I think he realized, I don't have the leverage. Outside of 1992, the players have never had the leverage, right? So 2004, 2005, using that leverage, the owners not only get their salary cap, but they forced out Bob Goodenow, who might have been one of the best who negotiated on, on behalf of the players. I thought Goodenow was good, but again... The players looked at that and said, now we have to play under a cap. You told us you wouldn't, and we're done with you. 2012-2013, uh, we ended up with a 48-game season. And again, it's about money. So the owners gave the players 47% or 57% of league revenues and immediately started complaining. The, immediately, the owners were, wait, this is, this is too much. Why are they getting so much of a share? We're making less than half 
of what they make this is this is ridiculous this is wrong so immediately there was talks of rolling back the salaries and and the the union again gets creative and there was dueling offers we know you're going to refuse this but well we know you're going to refuse this but and again the public is dragged in with those players they're really greedy and you know the players coming out and complaining one thing that helps the owners is you have Gary Bettman basically being the only voice heard on the owner's side. You'll get some owners talking here and there, but in general, it's usually Bettman. For the players, it could be anybody. I mean, yes, Don Fear may be the one that comes out and talks, but in general, you will find, because there's so many players and they have so many different ideas for how things should go and for what they want, you're going to have some sound bites from players that make it sound like the union is not united. So... The ownership you have at the time, 30 owners, now it's up to 32, but they can form that united front and, and all agree on something. Whereas when you've got over 300 hockey players, there's, there's not going to be unanimity. Now, one of the reasons I've stated with Bettman being in charge and staying in charge is just money. For, for the ownership, I mean, everything else that we've talked about with the Chicago Blackhawks over the last week, which is just egregious... It do, and I hate to say it this way, it does not affect the NHL's bottom line. So the owners don't look at this and say, we need to get Batman out because. And then if the owners aren't of the mind that Batman needs to go, he keeps that job. Unless Batman himself comes forward and says, I think I'm going to step down. And even then, if Batman stepped down, you would end up with Bill Daly then as likely being the next commissioner if he wants the job. I don't know that the storyline changes with Daly, other than Daly doesn't seem to get the vitriol from the fans that Bettman does. But if Daly was in charge and saying the same things, that vitriol gets transferred to, to Bill Daly. Vegas came in at $500 million for their expansion fee. Seattle came in at $650 million in their expansion fee. All of that money went to the owners. None of it went to the players. The fact that you have a league where over a billion dollars comes in and the players don't get a cent of it is a big part of the reason why Gary Bettman is still in charge. That is a lot of money in the pockets of 30 different owners. Again, Vegas was not eligible for any of the money from Seattle. So when we look at the overall picture, from a financial standpoint, the NHL has done very well. Uh, before March of 2020, the, the, the NHL revenues were at a record high. They were at around $5 billion a year. Now, those have dropped. I, I don't think they're going to recover this year either. They're definitely adding a whole bunch of advertising and, and gambling and more advertising and more gambling to a point where I'm kind of uncomfortable with some of it. Because, like, during a hockey game to see at the top of the screen, right now the betting line for this to happen in this game is, I, I think you might be going a little too far there. But again, I understand that's that's all about money. It's all about money. So when the concussion lawsuit comes forward, right, Batman and the NHL defense was, we do not believe that NHL hockey players are getting CTE from injuries sustained in the NHL. And we can have that debate about whether they're just concussions or it's other kinds of head trauma because you can get a concussion without direct contact to the head. I've seen it. I know it happens. But the NHL settled out of court. They settled out of court and the players are told, here's here's your money and that's it. And the amount of money the players got was nowhere near the amount of money that the NHL could have provided, right? And which is which is standard. Here's your here's your lawsuit money. Now go away. That's that. And with all the social issues, I know people got mad last year over, you know, in the bubble and they had the whole Black Lives Matter discussion. They had it once. What the NHL has done throughout, and, and again, that's just one example, they're never the leader on something that has to do with a social issue. They always follow other leagues, and it's always the absolute bare minimum that's done. And again, this is an ownership thing. It does them no good to, um, to shut anything down. It does them no good to potentially alienate some of their paid customers. They don't want to alienate any paid, any paid customers. If we have this message on here, we might alienate people. We don't want to do that. And this is where that whole old boys network thing comes in too of, well, 
uh, you know, that it sucks that A happened, but we don't want to have have B be a, a you know us losing money as a result. So Gary Bettman comes out, and again, Gary Bettman will say something publicly that people will say, "Oh, that's terrible! Come on." The owners are fine with it, as long as you're mad with him. The owners are quite happy. That's it. They're making tons of cash, lots of money. Chicago Blackhawks, two million dollar fine, and it goes into whatever conscious and I, I know like a million goes here and a million goes there it is it is it is penance it is so little it is it is absolutely a minute amount but because that fine is there that leaves him to say hey that's it we're done we're good that's that is an absolute slap on the wrist that the hawks are going to be feeling that is a substantial amount that is you know, I, I'm telling that's a substantial amount. And he will say that. And I know yesterday he had a rough time with that press conference and people are all over him. But the plan for the NHL is eventually we all forget. And and a lot of where this comes from is that uh, I, I lost count of how many times in the 80s, early 90s, we'd hear about somebody driving under the influence. We'd hear about a domestic violence uh, issue involving one of the NHL's players. And it would go away. You know, people would be mad and there would be like, I, I can't believe, you know, this guy's still playing. But it goes away. What's interesting is the last time I mentioned this in a the video, there were people as well that speculated on who I was talking about. And everybody had a different name. And all of the instances they're talking about, I remember. There are players. And I and again, when I say this, people will speculate. And, and there's multiple names. There are players that I look at and I say, wow, they had a good career. But because of all this other crap that took place, I can't do a career video on them because I'd have to talk about that other side too. And so it, it becomes kind of a mess, right? Uh, career videos should be about, you know, discussing, I really like this player or this player, look at all the things he did and look at, and, and if, if there's, if there's that DUI, that domestic, and if there's no, I don't want to say comeuppance because that's the wrong terminology, but if there's no consequence, that, that works, right? There's no consequence either for them or for, from the league or anything well, it kind of it seems odd doesn't it uh it is it, it it is a a league that has been riddled with various uh incidents and co controversies that again years ago nothing i part of the reason why i get all those old hockey news magazines there's controversies through them dating back to the ones i've got in the 70s where i'm like oh i never heard of that because it all goes away. Now in this day of social media, it takes a little longer for it to go away, but eventually most of it will. At least that's what the NHL is betting on. The NHL is betting on us as fans, pushing it all aside and saying, you know, that's, that's terrible that that happened, but, and then you move on and you move on. And for the owners, they're in charge of, of what happens with Gary Bettman. So, you know, fan outrage and everything is one thing, but it's it's honestly, it's being directed at the guy who, as the commissioner, is being paid really good money so that the owners aren't the public face of this. Before we had a commissioner, back when it was John Ziegler, you would hear things from owners. And and not, not necessarily like during the shutdown in 2020, where we heard some things from owners that were like, well, that's tone deaf. But just some stuff from owners, you'd be like, wow, really? And it's changed now. It's just basically, hey, don't say anything publicly and, and just leave it to Gary. So I guarantee you there's at least an owner or two that may have watched that conference yesterday, if they cared, if they watched it at all. Probably just got notes on what happened. They might cringe at some of the stuff that was said. They might be upset with some of the stuff that was said. But he's their employee. And as long as he's out there taking the heat, the owners don't. The league really doesn't because the league is not Gary Bettman. He is, he's the commissioner. He's not the NHL. The NHL is all these owners, it's board of governors, and there's no pressure on them because we get mad at him. What he's done since he took over is take all the heat. He has made sure that the players, their, their, their salaries are controlled and they're, they're kept lower than they would be if we didn't have a cap. 
He makes sure that the Sunbelt teams are pretty well protected because that's what the league wants. That's what the other owners want. They don't want to lose that market in Phoenix. They don't want to lose a market in Miami because they know how big that market is and how, how big it could be. That's why they went back to Atlanta. And if not for losing that building, I'd argue they'd still have the Atlanta Thrashers. The Atlanta Thrashers did not draw as the worst draw in the NHL. Uh, they, they moved because they were out of their building. And that's why when Arizona, when it was it was said that Gila River was throwing them out, I said, this is the one thing, if anything, that could cause a move. And yet, in all likelihood, it doesn't. So for, for the owners, this is going the way they want it to. And we can we can be mad over the, the fallout of the Chicago Blackhawks thing not being what we want it to be, but it's the league that's saying, we need this to go away. And for Bettman... He's not going to. We we as as fans don't. I mean, you can you can put up any uh, sort of petition you want, but the owners won't read it. Uh, I don't believe they'll read it. Uh, the they they care what the fans think on the level that they want to make sure that they're not losing season ticket holders. They want to make sure they're not losing money, but unless it affects their bottom line, I don't I don't think it makes a big difference. But. I don't think this is unique to the NHL either. I think it's it's in every sport. Uh, I've always been surprised at how baseball bounced back. And yet, to me, it's always seemed like baseball, there's this really uneasy piece there that eventually is going to blow up. And that could happen with Major League Baseball over the next 12 months here. Uh, because, yeah, it's just felt like there's just, it's, it's going to blow up at some point. Because that's how these relationships work with so much money on the line. And in some cases, you may have owners that just, yeah, you know, player safety is not that important. So when you talk about, well, why aren't more people being suspended and why aren't they taking this more seriously and that more seriously? It's the demand. It's it's the, so I mean, you, you've you got, uh, again, people being put in a, in a situation where I, I, I think they get a lot more blame than they probably should. I think there's guidelines that are there on what to suspend and when. And they just they just follow that guideline, and so you know that's why when when suspensions take place, I don't get really mad and you know throw things or anything because I, I get it, I get it. There's a lot of money involved. There's ownership involved here, and so in some cases it might be a slap on the wrist. Some cases it might be a little bit overboard, and that's just that's how the National Hockey League works. So there you go, just a little discussion on Gary Bettman league happenings in general and all that wonderful stuff let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through you just happened upon this video and for anybody wondering about gil stein and why he was only in there for a year yeah he put himself in the hall of fame um can't can't do that he just got the job and then it was and in the hall of fame is gil stein and it's like i don't think he should be there and pretty quickly he he was he was out but that was, that was an entertaining side of things that we all got a good chuckle out of at the time. A lot of the stuff going on right now, there really isn't anything to laugh about. There you go. Uh, thank you guys so much for all your support. As always, I will talk to you again soon.